So, Chris, I understand you want to talk to us today about industrial control systems. Um, yeah, I just want to go a quick overview of some of the vulnerabilities we see in industrial control systems. I feel like I'm not sure, but I'm not sure if we've done a topic on this type before. So I'm hoping this will be informative and something a little different than some of the stuff we talk about normally. But to give some examples of industrial control systems, think power plants, water filtration systems, oil pipelines, and even smaller scale, such as building automation, embedded systems. Um, I even put IoT devices, which is arguably industrial control system, but there is some divide, but they are, IoT devices are pretty related to ICS, in my opinion, since a lot of these sensors are IoT devices that are used in industrial control systems, like, like um, fuel gauges and temperature gauges and stuff like that. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about SCADA and some vulnerabilities within SCADA. SCADA is essentially the backbone of industrial control systems. It's kind of the network that connects all the PLCs and essentially tells some of the PLCs what to do. And PLCs are logic controllers, which an example of that would be if the temperature reaches 90 degrees, a PLC will trigger a motor to turn on the HVAC system to cool down the system is a quick example of what a PLC is. Um, so why is industrial control systems important? Um, well, so a lot of these systems are pretty critical to infrastructure, such as power plants. A ad adversary or nation state could take down a power plant and whole block or city can lose power. And a lot of these um, devices once you trigger false data to trigger a PLC, um, it's irreversible. And you kind of see that in Stuxnet, which is probably the most famous um, most famous industrial control system attack, or arguably one of the most famous ones, where malware was injected into the system and some of the and it caused the centrifuges to um, essentially tear themselves apart, taking down Iran's nuclear program. And you see some newer um, attacks, such as like the in-controller ICS malware, which communicates over the Modbus protocol in ICS systems and is able to delete files, send packets, and attempt a DDoS attack. So a lot of these um, issues with PLCs is they are attacked. It's a lot of irreversible. The centrifuges are broken, power is going out, uh, transmission lines being burned, and they can't come up. So once some of these um, lot, some of these logic, some of the logic is triggered, it's you can't go back and you can't really fix it, or it's very expensive to, and you have to rebuild it. Um, some differences between ICS and traditional networks, traditional IT networks. Um, you typically a lot of the operators consider availability more important than confidentiality, confidentiality and integrity. And if you ask people in traditional networks, they probably say confidential confidentiality and integrity is probably more important than availability. Especially if you think about these like um, holistically, um, it's pretty important to have clean water and power generation, and those systems need to be up at almost 99% of the time. So because of that, there's more infrequent patching in industrial control systems. Um, systems are typically older and not updated as much. and Part of the problem is operators don't necessarily want to change how things have worked. Things have been working, say, the system's been going on for years now and they don't want to change or essentially break um, their PLC program or their SCADA system. And with even with the differences, um, there are still common vulnerabilities that traditional IT networks face that are still in ICS. So such as, um, Windows malware and Windows vulnerabilities. So a lot of the operation centers are all Windows servers and computers. So those are still susceptible to Windows vulnerabilities and malware. Um, so to give a brief overview of some common vulnerabilities, um, a lot of these PLCs are still um, susceptible to buffer overflow attacks. A lot of them are older and aren't updated as frequently. You can get memory corruption attacks and that can be fatal to your system they can adversaries can use that to take down the system in a ddos attack or use it to 
get remote access or remote shell to the system and then be able to move laterally throughout the industrial control system. And I brought up IoT devices before. Um, IoT devices a lot of times are connected to industrial control systems and a common issue we see with IoT devices is that they're still using default username and passwords. And if they're connected to the internet, adversaries are able to be able to log on to the vault username and passwords and steal all the data that the IoT devices are collecting. Or even worse, use it to move laterally to be able to get to the PLCs and trigger a logic bomb. I mean, a logic bomb essentially just kind of tricks the logic of the PLCs to do something that's not supposed to do and either disrupt or destroy some operation. And noticed in Trend Micro, um, the data research that it takes about 30 more days to patch a system in SCADA verse than a typical Microsoft or Adobe software or FastAct or other software that's able to be pushed out quickly. But yeah, that's just a brief overview of some common vulnerabilities I see. I do want to get um, your opinion, your guys' opinion on what you see in ICS and what issues kind of we face with ICS vulnerabilities. Yeah, we, we talk all the time for many years on this show about, you know, air gapping, trying to physically isolate certain types of networks. And a lot of these really ideally would be completely air gaps, not touching the internet because partially because of the the criticality of the systems, you know, you know, the electrical grid or the, you know, the water system or whatever, you really don't want those connected to the outside world to give the attackers a way to get in there from the internet. Um, and I, you know, yes, there, there is a lot of hesitation to change things that have always worked changing the programming in PLCs is is not necessarily a you know non-trivial <laughs> act in and of itself and so I, I kind of understand a little bit of the hesitancy because you know these things are controlling in some cases you know these massive robots I'm thinking it, like my son works uh, for a car manufacturer dealing with the robots on the assembly line and if it's you know he's he's talking about the he talks about these plcs all the time that you know a, a minor tweak that you might not think is, is all that significant under the right circumstances could bring the entire assembly line to a halt or you know damage you know the the car that's coming down the assembly line so i i understand some of the reluctance there, and that's why, to the extent possible, I, I I think they really do need to be disconnected. Once they're connected, it, it it really worries me once these get connected to the internet because then, you know, the paths in and the potential damage that they can do. Um, it's it's. There are a lot of similarities to the kinds of things that we've talked about and that I've done in my career on a daily basis, but there are some distinct differences that need to be taken into account. So, no, I agree with that. Um, I think one of the the things that I keep thinking back to about PLCs and SCADA and things like that is that it still seems like a less explored area of security. And I could be wrong. I know there's a whole S4 conference for people who do specifically this, and it's been running for years. Uh, there are people who are experts in it, but it doesn't seem to have quite the um, the widespread amount of information about it that you would expect from web application hacking, you know, buffer overflows, what we consider more traditional or classical uh, hacking techniques. Uh, is that do you guys have the same opinion of it, or do you feel like maybe it's it's gotten more accessible to people? It, it yeah. it's still it's still a niche area. I mean, I I know some people, um, you know, Rob Lee, the the bearded Rob Lee, <laughs> has made a career out of it, you know, for the last ten or twelve years, and 
you know, and he's shining light on it. Uh, he's, you know, testified before Congress and before the UN. So I, I, I know there are some people working on it, but you're right. I don't think it has the exposure. I, I, th I think this is a hard problem. And I, I don't think there are simple solutions. You know, other than to the extent possible, just keeping them off the Internet. I'm trying to think of anything that might. Push forward the state of the art in in the way that we research these sorts of things. And to me, I, I take the. The approach of more eyes is better, like, you know, having a village at DEF CON or having some sort of open source implementation that people can poke at and be like, oh, OK, now I get this and now I know how to apply. You know, the things that I've learned here in. <laughs> To use, I think the, the OWASP version name it was a PLC goat or whatever you know attack target you want to put out there for people to learn how to do this stuff and then apply that in the, in um, in whatever environments you have this stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I maybe it's just that I'm not close enough to it, but it seems like we've been talking about it for a while ever since. For me, it was you know Stuxnet was the big one that everyone started really paying attention to it. Um, I don't know. And then, you yeah. know, the wipers and things like that. But yeah, I feel like the information out there on PLC and vulnerabilities is less than other like website vulnerabilities, like you said, Matt. Um, I think a good first step um, is having more people kind of get involved in understanding how PLCs actually work and understanding how logic works as well. I, yeah, I feel like the just there's just less ICS analysts out there, I feel like. Um, and I don't know the exact number, but I just see much more common that people know, like website hacking, analyzing packets, and um, doing some of that offensive and uh, red team, blue team type. And it's not as much as um, how do we like trigger a logic bomb or prevent a logic bomb in uh, industrial control systems. Uh, I, I think you're right. I, I think there is definitely room for more you know for more people to to think about this do research to get it out there but again i'm not i'm not that closely tied to that so maybe there are more conferences out there for folks worried about this kind of stuff than i'm aware of but you know i i think you're both right i think having you know a village to you know concentrate on just SCADA ICS related stuff I think would would draw some attention to it and might get some people interested in doing additional research on how to secure them well it's not just that it's it's getting more people who want to learn the offensive side of testing these things and then giving the vendors a place where they can bring hardware and if they're absolutely clueless about this stuff, get a sort of a rude awakening, maybe a gentle rude awakening, a, gen a gentle awakening, um, but also have a place where they can they can feel like they can get people to, to poke at this stuff and show them the ropes uh, in kind of a controlled environment, as opposed to like finding out that somebody with incredible amounts of resources and a lab some, somewhere filled with PLCs um, doing the work of a nation state is the one finding the vulnerabilities first and not somebody right. at DEF CON who's, who's doing it for fun. Right. Yeah, I actually saw um, the other day that IANS actually has a course for ICS vulnerabilities and PLC programming. So I was um, pleased to see that. I'm not sure how long it's been going on, how long they've had that course, but I think that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and there are, you know, SANS has a curriculum for ICS stuff that probably is the primary author of the intro course to that. So there are some opportunities out there, but I think I think we do need more eyes on the problem. So instead of a, well, maybe take a different tact and say, instead of having more eyes on the problem, is there anything that the folks who de design these things can do to make a more secure or more fault tolerant or just a less fragile PLC or a device like this? Is there anything that in general you could you would recommend? Well, I, I think they suffer from a similar problem 
to where web app development was 10, 15 years ago is nobody was thinking about security, you know, and building security into the to the web apps from the beginning. And I, I think there's still, to some extent, the same issue with ICS and SCADA now is that they don't, you know, when they're building them from the, they're not thinking security from the start and they're not thinking how might an attacker try to attack this. What they're worried about is how do we get the robot to move, you know, you know, this piece over there at, at the same time that it, this other piece is coming so that we can bolt them together or, or whatever, you know, so, um, you know, I, th I think the, the mindset of, you know, considering security at the beginning of the development process, I don't think that's entirely there yet. And it, it needs to be. Yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. Um, a lot of these probably older uh, PLCs and SCADA systems also pro send data unencrypted. And it's, it's difficult to add to it because you can't just stop the system to add encryption right now. It's got to it's got to be up and running. That's another question, right? It's it seems like people do design these things, and you've got one or two PLCs, and they do the job, and they're physically sitting there, and there's no way to take them out of the loop without causing a catastrophe. Right. I think for years in the IT side of things, we've had disaster recovery plans, we've had hot spares, we've had machines that if one goes down, another one takes its place fairly seamlessly. I guess. No one's come up with that for uh, for SCADA, or is it a matter of cost? I mean, do you guys know? I mean, I think I think it's just part of its cost, and a lot of this this equipment's large and hard to move. I think so. Um, guess if um, like if a, um, false data triggers a PLC to fry a um, a motor, um, it's much harder to replace than how we kind of do a lot in the cloud and just spin up a new mm. Azure virtual machine or AWS virtual machine or Kubernetes cluster. Like I'm able to do those in seconds, minutes, while just hot and swapping it, a motor might be a little more difficult. Right. It's, uh, you know, we, for, for years, we've been pushed towards just in time, this and that, where, you know, you don't want to have a lot of, capital invested in stuff that's sitting around doing nothing and i think that's that's part of the problem here you know some of this equipment is really expensive and to have a hot spare sitting around is really expensive you know the question is compare that with the downtime for taking the whole thing offline you know but that's that's a, a a risk assessment that is you know way above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. ICS vulnerabilities are are here, and you might not think of them every day um, because a lot of these networks are segmented and offline. But if there's ever a breach in them, a lot of these PLCs um, they're hard to protect because you can't necessarily um, hot swap a motor or have backups because these are running heavy machinery very expensive and hard to create so it's it's good to be aware of your plc logic and make sure you're able to protect it as best as you can